human being as a human being and that we are all worthy of respect and love from others, regardless of what we look like or sound like or what other people think our capabilities are or are not. And sometimes we can prove to people that we're capable of things that they don't think we are. Welcome back to Happiness and Progress. I'm your host, Danielle Craig. I'm an Emmy Award winner, former journalist, mom, wife, and just a person looking for more joy in the everyday. On this podcast, you'll hear stories of inspiration, overcoming, and perspective that will help you become the best version of you. This podcast is brought to you by The Mail Tribune. Check out mailtribune.com for more podcasts. If you like this podcast, don't forget to click subscribe and give it a rating in iTunes. It really helps me out. Out. It helps me continue doing this work. And guess what? I just need one more rating to get to 100 ratings. So will you be the 100th person to rate my podcast? I hope so. You have to have iTunes or be listening on your iPhone to be able to do that. Okay, let's get to today's guest, Michaela Stevens. Michaela is an elementary school teacher. She is the 2017 winner of the Limelight Video Contest in which she told her story, living and teaching with a form of dwarfism and blindness. Michaela teaches lower elementary school children, most of whom she is smaller than. She also does this with a visual impairment that causes her to be legally blind. But she doesn't let this hold her back, and I just absolutely love that about her. When I first reached out to Michaela, I really thought we would chat about the difficulties of dealing with these disabilities, or disadvantages, as she likes to call them. But I realized some of the biggest difficulties she deals with are less to do with dwarfism and blindness, but instead her classroom. So I really wanted to talk about that, especially because so many of you have children or grandchildren sitting in a classroom every single day. In this episode, you're going to hear a lot about the challenges that come with being a teacher in the 21st century, how you can help your child be successful socially, and how Michaela deals with violent outbursts in her classroom. Plus, we're going to talk about how Michaela has always been optimistic, her secret to having the happiness skill, and how to start loving the person you are today. Let's get to it. Let's start with you just telling us a little bit about yourself. I teach elementary school. I've been teaching for about three years, and I love kids. We have fun at school, but we also like to learn. I really try to get kids to work really hard and to be happy. And I love anything musical. I like being outside. I like the sunshine. And... I love being happy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's perfect for this podcast. Right? (laughs) So you've been teaching now for three years. Um, Actually, two. So this is my third year. I apologize. Okay, okay, okay. (laughs) Tell me about some of the challenges you've faced while teaching. Is it still first through third? It is, yeah. So I actually think that my biggest challenges come from the lack of support in the education system, which is very unfortunate. Teachers just don't have the resources they need. Mm -hmm. And uh, children are just becoming harder and harder to discipline. Yeah, I think it's related to technology and it's related to maybe parents aren't laying down enough boundaries for their children at home. They're just putting them on iPads instead of teaching them. It's easier, right? Yeah. To just put your child on a screen than to teach them. And also, I mean, I think it comes a lot from two working parents, you know, they just don't have the time or the energy or the wherewithal to really discipline their kids the way they need to. And it really spills over a lot into the classroom. I would say that's the biggest challenge. Wow. So how do you deal with that? Very carefully. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we haven't even told everyone that you're doing this while legally blind. I've talked to people who are legally blind. I've interviewed people who are legally blind. And my understanding, at least my limited understanding, is there are varying degrees of what can be seen. Are you seeing anything of the kids or or no? So a little bit. It's not very usable for me, mm-hmm. but 
it's, it is some, sometimes I say, you know, Hey, please don't do that. Or, and they're like, Oh, you, you could see that. And I'm like, well, I mean a little bit, but also like, I don't think they understand how much I can pick up <laughs> Yeah, just from being able to hear and just intuition a little bit too. You know, kids, they haven't changed much. <laughs> They're <laughs> sneaky and it's not hard to spot. <laughs> right. So what do you do when, well, some of the outbursts can be pretty severe, pretty violent. At least that's what we've been seeing here in Oregon. When there are outbursts like that, how do you deal with that? Depending on the severity of the outburst, we typically have administration administrators come in and get involved in helping. It's difficult because they come in when the situation is very heightened and they don't necessarily have a relationship with the child that we do. It's not quite as close. I try to get children de-escalated as quickly as possible, really. So... In my classroom, we have some different sensorial things, Play-Doh, a trampoline. If a child is kicking, that's telling me that they need to do something with their feet. So I will send them on a walk somewhere or I will have them jump on a little, you know, one of those little trampolines that just sits six inches above the ground. Yeah. I'll have them jump for a minute and usually getting out some of that energy in a positive way helps them come down so that they can get to a place where we can solve the problem. Mm, Wow. I just love... It's tricky. Yeah. I just love how you said that easy tip. If their legs are moving, they need to get up and be jumping or walking. Yeah. Is there anything else like that that's just really tangible, an easy tip that a parent or an educator listening could take into their own home or their own classroom? Yeah. So if they need to do something with their hands, if they're kicking or whatnot, I tried uh, stress balls. <laughs> mm-hmm. They didn't work very well for me last year because kids would throw them and they would rip them. Mm-hmm. Chew on them. All those we had the problem in my house. <laughs> <laughs> right. But depending on the child, a uh, stress ball could be a good option. Play-Doh is a really good option. Sometimes I just let them doodle, doodle for a minute, just having their brain kind of wander and do something like that really actually can calm them down really well. And sometimes they have kids who have, you know, fights with other children. And sometimes I had this little girl last year who drew a comic of her and her friends fight and it ended up being a peaceful resolution. (laughs) So I thought that was a really healthy way for her to get out her, her energy. And sometimes a child needs to talk. They, they just need to go on a walk and know that, that someone hears them. So sometimes when a child has a complete outburst, I will just say, did you sleep last night? And it opens up all kinds of, sometimes they start crying. No. And I mean, if you don't have your basic needs met, you know, it's going to be really hard for you to function in a way that I'm expecting you to function. So sometimes I just have to get down to the root. It's, it's tricky. And really like, it depends sometimes on my mood (laughs) too. You know, if I have slept the night before, if I'm at my A game of like trying to be intuitive and, and trying to figure out where the kids are at, yeah, it can, mm-hmm. that can also be really tricky. So it really just depends. I kind of just have to follow. But those are some, some tools that I have found that work. Have there been situations where you feel like you're not safe? I'm thinking <laughs> up to third grade, there must be at least a couple of the grades who are a little bit bigger than you. <laughs> Actually, funny enough, I don't think I have any children who are uh, smaller than me. <laughs> They're all big. Yeah. So, so yes, actually, there have been some situations where it's been unsafe. And I try to remember that I have to protect all the other little humans in my classroom. Yeah. And yeah. so even if I have to put myself at risk, I have to, you know. And usually the kids... The ones who have hurt me, it was not severe, but the ones who have, they really do feel remorseful afterward. And we're able to have that conversation of, it's not okay for you to hurt other people. Instead, you can do this or this. And I try to do restitution, different restitution activities, like writing apology letters or doing something nice Mm -hmm. for that person, something to make it right, because you can't just hurt someone and get away with it, you know? Um, but yeah, it, it does get unsafe and I really just have to 
kind of try to talk them down mm-hmm. right. before it gets worse and make sure that there aren't other kids around, you know? And honestly, I kind of keep my distance a little bit too, like if they're throwing furniture. Mm. You know what I hate? How casually you just said that. I know yeah. it's happening in our classrooms <laughs> yeah. here locally. It's happening in your classrooms. Yeah, But it's it just, does. it's really a little unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. I When I was in elementary school, I never remember people, children acting like that ever. Mm-hmm. I just think that it's it's crazy, the, the things that we're seeing. Mm-hmm. Is it hard after a day of maybe getting hit or getting hurt in some way to return to the classroom? Oh, yeah. Totally. How do you walk yourself back into the classroom? What is your mental game as you go in? I usually have to get something out before I go back in. So I really like to vent. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I I have to tell someone or like get some kind of feedback from someone and take some deep breaths. A lot of times I don't necessarily go back in the classroom in a good headspace, which is isn't necessarily a good thing, but I mean, it's all teachers can do to keep up with all the demands. I can't be out of the classroom forever, you know? Right. And so Mm -hmm. sometimes I just have to go back and try to suck it up. Yeah. And then, you know, that night, try and do something to get myself back in a peaceful, calm place. What does it look like when you're in the classroom, just sucking it up, like grinning and bearing it? What does that look like? (laughs) Taking deep breaths, Sometimes stepping back and observing for a second and, you know, taking just a minute, if anything, for myself to just, and sometimes I'm bombarded at that moment and I will just look at a child and say, look, I can't help you right now. I need you to go sit down. Like I need a minute. Mm -hmm. And I like the kids to know that I have those negative emotions too. So, you know, I'll, I'll tell the kids sometimes like, I'm feeling stressed. I need your help. You know, go sit down. I need you to find something peaceful. Like, give me just a minute. And I like them to be able to watch me walk through that process of being in a negative place because it happens to all of us, right? And I just think that it's a real disadvantage if they think that I'm just always happy-go-lucky, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's such a great lesson. I think so. I also like to apologize to them afterward. I've apologized to the entire class before. Mm. And it's amazing to me how they will just forgive me like an instant. It's such a lesson to me. I love apologizing to them because I really do feel like they forgive me and like I can try again. It's beautiful. How can we as adults create that for each other and our children? <laughs> Right. And I feel (laughs) like forgiveness is so hard. It is. I mean, we just have to try. Yeah. I feel like that's all we can do. Give people second chances. Now that you've been teaching for two years, Mm -hmm. how teachers, when they start to teach, they get in there with like these pure (laughs) hearts of shaping the next generation. (laughs) But now you're in it two years. Where are you now? I have wanted to be a teacher since I was about two or three. I would set up those little plastic chairs. Do you remember those little kid chairs? Mm -hmm. And I would make my siblings sit down and I would put stuffed animals and dolls on the empty chairs and I would pretend to teach school. It was always my thing. And as I grew up, I kind of was discouraged by different people from doing it for various reasons, financial stability. You really want to go wipe kids' noses and tie their shoes, stuff like that. The people kind of would discourage me from it. But eventually I came back to it and I really thought it would be different because I think it was different when I was a kid. I really do. Yeah. Unless my memory is really off, but I really do feel like it was different. And I think it would have been a different experience had I been teaching in the nineties. In fact, I have talked to people who've been teaching for 30 years and they do say it is so different than it was. Wow. So, yeah, it's it's a lot harder than I imagined it being. Do you find that the kids are respectful to you? That's a really hard question. Some of them, yes. I think they want to be for the most part. However, I think they have a lot of challenges in their life, right? I think there's a lot of toxic behavior in our world. 
And I think that children are picking up on it and it's becoming harder and harder to be a child, right? Like look at just the anxiety levels that are increasing in our world. And I I have children who won't even try because they're scared to fail. And I tell them, I say, look, if you don't fail, that's telling me you're not learning. I need you to go fail right now. Like it has to happen at school. Like you Mm -hmm. can't be scared to pick up your pencil, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just think that because of that, it's really become a difficult place. And so I really try. I mean, last year, my thing was I wanted my classroom to be a Zen environment (laughs) because anxiety is already so high. And I feel like children feel like the stakes are so much higher than they are. Yeah. I'm like, you're already a child. Like you're a child. You, you can make as many mistakes as you want to now. Yeah. If you make big mistakes later, they might have bigger consequences. But right now, like it's okay. You go right ahead and fail. Now's the time. I even like to tell adults it's okay to fail. Exactly. It is. It really is. (laughs) Do you feel the kids have trouble respecting teachers regardless of who they are? I was wondering if they have an issue respecting you because you're dealing with a form of dwarfism. I I don't actually think so. It doesn't take very long for me to earn respect for most children. And I think it's because they don't view physical or whatever kinds of differences in the same way that adults do. Yeah. Right. So I can sit down with a child and say, they're like, why are you so tiny? You know, I get that all the time. Mm-hmm. And I just say, oh, I don't know. I was born that way. But isn't that pretty cool? We're all different. And it's OK. I'm still your teacher, you know. Yeah. And I actually found and I even had people tell me this. They were like, your class, the administrators would tell me this. They're like, your class responds better to you than they do to any other adults in the school. Wow. And I think part of that is that I had a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. But I think the other part of it is that, like, I gained their respect. And honestly, I think I sort of have an advantage because I'm right at eye level. I'm not towering over them. Yeah. And I think there's a bit of a difference there. Mm-hmm. What do you think you're teaching them just by the fact that you're there and you are teaching them, you're legally blind? What do you think you are teaching them about differences? The number one thing, I want my ch- my children to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, all the things that are required. Yeah. But I feel like if they learn anything, the number one thing I would want them to learn is that every human deserves love and kindness. Hmm. And I tell them that so, so many times, and even all living things, not just humans. Yeah. I tell them that all the time, and I really, really hope that they come away with that lesson because... I know that there are, you know, there's so much time put into the academics, which really matters. And that's really important. That's what I'm hired to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And legally responsible for. However, I think the more important, especially life lesson, is that really a human being is a human being and that we are all worthy of respect and love from others, regardless of what we look like or sound like or what other people think our capabilities are or are not. Yeah. And sometimes we can prove to people that we're capable of things that they don't think we are. Yeah, I love that. And I really hope that they learn that, that it doesn't matter who you are, you can do what you put your mind to. Have you had any students with disabilities? And I hate using that word. I'm talking to a woman who has her master's and (laughs) here I am asking about disabilities. Did you get your master's? I'm working on okay, it. Okay. I knew you were working yes, on it. Yes, I'm working on it. So. Okay. I have a friend who <laughs> likes to call disabilities exceptionalities. I like that. I, I also like disadvantage. Mm. That's what I call it sometimes. Have <laughs> you had any students then with disadvantages? Yes, I have. How do you empower them? I really hope that I do. <laughs> I Most of them are, are different than what I deal with, but it doesn't really matter what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And honestly, even if you don't have a diagnosed condition, everybody has something, you know, whether you have a hard time controlling your anger, you know, whether you are really hard on yourself, Mm. everybody has something that makes it difficult for them to do the things that they need to do in their life. Right. And so with children who have differences. You know, I really like to tell them you can do this. 
you can work hard like your friends. It might take you longer, but I know you can do this. You are amazing. Mm. And I hope that they really grasp that. I think it sometimes takes a lot of time to get there, but I hope they do. But starting with that influence, I think is so powerful. Yeah, I agree. In your Limelight video, which you won for, oh yeah, you talked about people thinking that it would be difficult for you to be a teacher while being legally blind. Uh huh. What have you found? Is it is it difficult? Does it add an extra layer of difficulty? So some things I would say it makes a little bit harder. For example, grading papers. We don't use computers because these are little children. They shouldn't be on computers very much at school. We do a little bit, but not work that needs to be graded. So that's one difficult thing that I have to have someone help me with. Mm -hmm. But really, as far as classroom management goes, there are a couple of strategies I use that actually put me on the same playing field, if not even above where other people are at in some ways. I have chimes on the door so that I know when people are leaving or coming into the classroom. And instead of having the kids raise their hands, I have them say their name. Mm -hmm. And then I call on them by saying their name back to them or saying yes. If just one of them said their name, I can say yes. Um, And also, children are very good at managing each other. (laughs) So... (laughs) They are. (laughs) Yes. I use that to my advantage. And some of it is annoying tattling, right? Right. And that just happens. That's (laughs) just the way That's where my mind went right away. And I just (laughs) love that you called it managing each other. (laughs) But sometimes the things they tell me are very necessary. Yeah. And I'm very grateful. And so sometimes, you know, I can, I kind of spotlight that as like a leadership moment. Like, oh, so-and-so, it's your turn to make sure that everyone is sitting at circle crisscross with their hands in their lap or, you know, whatever. And then they do. They, it's positive peer pressure. They do want to do what's right. And so they'll usually all do it. Yeah. It's almost like they are getting opportunity to become leaders and grow and yeah. learn responsibility. Absolutely. That's Which really I great. think is what every teacher should be offering their students. Yeah, and I've seen teachers who are really doing this really, really well. Mm-hmm. Okay, I want to go back to your Zen space, your Zen classroom. <laughs> Tell me how you create that. It's really different depending on the children. So last year, I did not use fluorescent lighting at all. Mm-hmm. We had lots of windows in our classroom. And I had a couple of lamps that had softer light, but I would keep the fluorescent lights turned off at all times. Mm -hmm. Is there a connection with the fluorescent lights and the activity level of the kids? I've seen research that shows that it does connect with the activity level, but it's also not good for their eyes. Huh. Wow. And if you think about it, when the lights are turned off, it feels more peaceful. Mm -hmm. I played peaceful music when they were working. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know if like how much of a difference any of these things made, but you know, I do think that the little things are the things that matter the most, right? Mm-hmm. So I also harped on kindness all the time. I was like, oh my goodness, I want to thank so and so for doing this kind thing. And then <laughs> it was funny, they would try to do things so that I would also say that they did something nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. So those are a few things that I did to try to, we had some different other things to spotlight kindness that I think also helped a little bit with the Zen, but Mm -hmm. sometimes we did yoga. They're like 10 minute YouTube videos. It's called Cosmic Kids. Mm -hmm. I think I've heard of that. For the first 10 minutes of the day, I let the kids run outside and having that time for them to move, I think gets their blood flowing and I I think it really helps them to focus and created a little bit more of a a peaceful place for them to be. What are you thinking about now as you are preparing for a new school year? I've got lots of plans. Some of them are probably unrealistic, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to make some alterations to what I did last year. I want to do a a positive self-talk. Ooh, I love that. some little positive self-talk cards that the kids can do every morning 
and I'll do some alterations. Like I, I don't want to do morning movement exactly the way I did last year, as far as the running goes. And I do want to do yoga a little bit more often. So there, there are some alterations that I want to make. And I think that it's going to be different too, with every group of students, it's you really have to get to know your mm-hmm. students. I had some very strong personalities last year in my classroom and I don't know all of my students, but a lot of the ones I know, they're more quiet and not quite as headstrong as the ones I had last year. Yeah. So this will be a different environment than it was. So some of that will change, I think, as like the first week happens. I'll be like, okay, I think we should try this and do this and move that over there. And, <laughs> you know, but I have lots of plans. I think every teacher starts the year with an unrealistic set of goals. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but it does help me not be as much of a perfectionist when I'm like, you know, all of this is probably not going to get done, but ideally (laughs) this is what I hope to do. It's good to have a little bit of leeway so you can cater to those exact personalities. Exactly. As a mom, when I was getting ready to send my first son to school, I had really prepared him academically. Mm-hmm. He could he went into kindergarten knowing how to do basic reading, basic mm-hmm. math. He could write his name. And, you know, preparing him like this, I was feeling pretty good about myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but... Once he got to school, I realized I did not prepare him socially. I did not prepare him to yeah. sit down in class, to uh-huh. raise his hand, to yep. resolve conflict, <laughs> to make friends, how to play with one another. So do you have tips for moms or p- dads on how to do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I would say it's, again, it's the little things. So make sure your kids are playing at the park with other kids or that they're, they're doing things with other kids, that's going to help them with the problem-solving part. Uh, you know, the last time on technology, even if it's just their siblings, you know, in the backyard, and if you need to give them a challenge, hey, I want you guys to go outside and work together on making a fort, you know, or mm-hmm. something. Get them outside, get them playing with other children, give them some kind of a challenge to solve. Also, especially during summer, set a timer, have them sit down and read. Yeah. for a certain amount of time or have them play a math game. You know, th- this will kind of get them back in the habit of having this time where we need to be still. Mm-hmm. I love that. Those are probably my two biggest suggestions, but along with that, limit their screen time. Mm-hmm. I know it's really hard. I know it's really hard, but it's going to make a bigger difference than you could probably imagine. This has really been the first year that I have dealt with, well, my my son wakes up before I do, and he just goes straight to the TV, turns on Ninjago, and then throughout the day, anytime he has oh. a spare minute, he finds himself right back in front of the TV. <laughs> so talking to other parents, have you found really any solid solution for when this age comes around and these kids are really just gravitating to the technology, to the screens. Uh Uh-huh. They do. You have to be really clear about your boundaries and very, very consistent. So, for example, one thing I really would like for parents of students, any students, especially students in my classroom to do is every night at a certain time, take away all of your child's devices. Uh I had an unbelievable amount of children tell me that they were up till all hours of the night playing on a tablet and they're really grumpy at school. They're screaming at other children. They're throwing things. They're very angry because they're so tired. Mm. And if that device wasn't there, if they had to go to bed, I think it would have helped. (laughs) So it's, it's putting down boundaries. It's being very consistent about them. It's being very clear about them and don't feel like your child is not going to like you they're actually probably going to respect you more. Mm-hmm. If you have very clear boundaries and you say at seven o'clock, your, your iPad is mine. Mm-hmm. It goes right here on this charging station. You may have it back tomorrow for this amount of time or on the weekend, whatever you decide is best for your children, stick to your guns. And for a while, for the first little bit, if you're just starting this, it might be hard. They might want to 
push back and they might be bored. You might have to give them some extra ideas at the beginning, but it will seriously be worth it. I think, especially in the long run, it you you will be grateful that you did. Do a lot of your kids already have their own devices? Oh, yeah. Wow. That's another thing I was very surprised and disappointed about. I imagine it must be hard to walk the line of not telling a person how to parent their kids, but being a good teacher. <laughs> mm-hmm. It is. <laughs> it is because I really, I don't want the parents to feel like I'm judging them because I know this is a very, very difficult thing to do. Yeah. And I know it can be very rewarding. And yet I have a different perspective because I'm really getting the aftermath of a lot of the choices that are being made. You know, children are with me for probably more hours than they're at home during the day. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really seeing the most. And school is hard, right? You have to sit down and focus and learn. And if you're not ready to do that, there's no amount of like there's no good teacher who can force a child to learn. You can't. You can't force anyone to learn. And so I know that it's hard, but I know that parents who put their mind to it can do it. Any parent out there can do it. I imagine throughout your life, you've dealt with a lot of challenges. As we all have. Yeah, all (laughs) of us. But how do those challenges of growing up compare to teaching? It's all different types of difficult, but it's funny. I don't know if it's because I've grown over the years, but it seems like the older I get, the more difficult my trials are. (laughs) I don't know if that's the case with everyone. Yeah. Well, it goes from (laughs) kids not liking you to something more serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that, you know, as we get, as we grow, and develop and we have more skills and tools, I think that we are thrown harder and harder things to deal with in our life. So they are, and every time in life, I'm like, this is so hard. But then I look back and I'm like, why did I think that was so hard? This is even harder. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so it's different, but it's hard. Do you think that gives you perspective when you're in it that you can say, okay, I'll be out of this and I'll say that wasn't that hard. Uh Uh-huh. Yep. It's actually somewhat comforting to remember like, oh, this is probably going to get better. And then it's probably going to get worse. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You started out saying you love to be happy. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that. How did you gain the happiness skill? I think the biggest way that people can be happy is to learn how to bounce back when something bad happens to you. Mm Mm-hmm. And there, it's different for everyone how you bounce back, but I think that's key. The biggest thing, and in almost everything I read about all these different negative emotions, one of the biggest ways we overcome it is through gratitude. Mm-hmm. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing what it does for our brains and our bodies to just be grateful. And you can be grateful for anything, everything, people places, things, experiences. Like it's, it's one of the best emotions. And I think that when we're in a grateful space, it's really hard to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's one of the biggest things, bouncing back and being grateful. And honestly, being grateful is one of the best ways to bounce back. Right. Because it's so easy to grab on to the things you're grateful for on the Mm -hmm. bounce back. Have you always been super happy? Were you super happy as a kid and all the way through adolescence? It's something that people have told me a lot. And I I have my moments. I'm not happy all the time. (laughs) But, and, and I think that also part of being happy is acknowledging the fact that it's okay to be mad. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be not okay. The thing that really matters is that you can get yourself back to a happy place at some point. So I, from what people tell me and from what I remember, I, I have always been happy. In fact, it's funny. I found a couple weeks ago, a book that I wrote in third grade. It was called a penny a year. And we collected a penny for each year of my life. And then I wrote a little snippet about what happened. And there were pictures that went with it. And I was reading it. And I thought to myself, 
man, I was really positive as a child. Some of the ways I wrote about some of these things that happened to me, I'm like, now I remember it a little bit more, a little bit worse than that. (laughs) But it's really cute to read that I'm like, oh, I did have a good childhood. I did remember, you know, good things did happen to me. Yeah. That I had that good perspective. For someone who is, well, I call myself a recovering pessimist for context. (laughs) For someone who is not naturally happy, what do you think Mm -hmm. would be a good first step to take to get started on that journey of happiness today? I I'm going to go back to what I said before. I think being grateful is one of the biggest things. You can keep a journal if that helps you to kind of look back to see what you're grateful for. That's probably going to help almost anyone. Mm -hmm. If you pray, you can be grateful when you pray. If you, you know, if you like music, if you like to dance, if you like, I love to dance. That's one of the ways that I bring myself back to a happy place when I'm having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I forget that because I don't always like to dance in front of other people. So if I don't have an opportunity (laughs) to do it by myself, then it, I forget that that's a way that I need to relieve my stress. Find what makes you happy. If you like to cook, if you like to hike, if you like to swim, if you like to underwater basket weave, Mm -hmm. (laughs) find your happiness somehow. And when you find yourself slipping into a place of despair, bring that back. Even if it's something really quick, taking 10 deep breaths, uh, counting sheep, whatever it is, bring yourself back to that in small and simple ways that you can remember. Going back into the school year, is there anything you want to tell parents about the teachers who really are trying their hardest for these kids? Love your child's teacher no matter what because teachers really, really are trying and we don't always have the resources that we need. And your child is going to make mistakes. And if if the teacher contacts you and says, you know, your child did this or this or this, remember that that teacher is still a person love that teacher anyway, you know, your child, it's okay for your child to do wrong. I wouldn't, I'm surprised by how many parents think their child can't do any wrong. And it's okay that your child does wrong. That is human nature. That's the way it is. I do things that are wrong. I will be the first to admit that. And so just no matter what happens, no matter what kind of negative situations or things happen at school no matter if you disagree with the teacher on something, it's okay. You you can tell the teacher you disagree, but whatever you do, please, please just love and respect your child's teacher. I love that. And I love what you said about not letting a child be wrong. There's a quote that says, don't let a problem to be solved be bigger than a child to be loved. This is something I quote to myself on a regular basis. Me too. I love that and quote. I only have the three kids. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, don't let the problems be solved be bigger than the child to be loved. <laughs> when you think of your life story, do you feel like there's a lot of overcoming? Yeah, I would say so. What are some of those hills you've climbed? So many. <laughs> some of them are physical. Some of them are emotional. Some of them are mental. Mm-hmm. I feel like, I mean, I'll, I'll give you the, the latest one that I'm climbing right now is dealing with people who really doubt me. Mm. And sometimes it's very apparent that they doubt me. And sometimes all they have to do is talk to me in a patronizing voice. And it just gets under my skin so much. (laughs) I don't like it. But I have to try to overcome that. In fact, I've been trying to think of a way to kindly teach people how to treat me because I I firmly believe that we teach people how to treat us. So, um, there's that. I, I think really the, the biggest challenges that I've overcome are similar to challenges that other people have overcome. I think a lot of people look at me and they're like, wow, you know, you've, you must've overcome a lot of things because you're short and you're blind. 
But in my mind, my my biggest challenges are related to relationships. They're related to an imperfect world. The similar things that other people are going through. Yeah. And so I think that when I remember that, I can overcome things easier because it puts me on a level playing field with others. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're not trying to be a victim. Right. Exactly. And and knowing that, you know, everybody has their things and yeah, there are definitely things to overcome that have to do with my exceptionalities, disadvantages, whatever you want to call them. But I think the the biggest thing that I've probably overcome with that is just being okay with who I am. Mm. And if somebody else is not okay with who I am, then that person doesn't need to be part of my life. Mm-hmm. And as harsh as that sounds, you know, that's that's the toxic kind of relationship that mm-hmm. I don't want. I think there are so many people in this world who are not okay with who they are. Yeah. What would be your advice to be okay with who you are? You need to learn to love yourself. Everybody has something to offer. Everybody has something good to give the world. And you need to get to that place where you love yourself. And one of the ways that I have really come to love myself is by... And I know that not everyone believes this. So whatever you're the equal, you know, the same thing that you have in your mind, I believe that I'm a child of God and that he loves me. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's really helped me to have worth in my own eyes. And so whatever that is for you, if you believe the universe, if you believe that other humans love you, which I know is the case, I Humans do love each other, you know, but you have to find that space where you love yourself and where you're okay with who you are, because you know what? It really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about you. Mm -hmm. You're you and you need to just embrace it, be who you are. I don't know if you saw The Greatest Showman. Mm -hmm. Of course. The song with the the bearded lady Mm -hmm. that was, this is me. Mm -hmm. She is unapologetically who she is. And if you haven't heard that song, you should go listen to it. That's what you need to be unapologetically who you are, no matter what the circumstance is. And try not to care what anybody else thinks. Try not to pay too much Mm -hmm. attention to what other people think. That is an anthem in our home. We love that. We turn that on full volume. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a good dance party song, too. I'm sure everyone listening (laughs) is thinking, oh, I love her. I wish she was my child's teacher. (laughs) (laughs) Do you think that you are teaching all of your kids, all your students to love who they are? I really hope so. I really try. I try to. And I think this year I will do an even better job than I've done. We we really learn from our, our experiences, I feel like. And I've learned a lot from my experiences. I think most of the children who have come to me have learned to love themselves at least more than they did Mm. before. And, you know, you can't change what somebody else thinks about themselves. I can try all day to tell them how amazing they are, to tell them, you know, but really until they grasp it, until they believe it, it's, it's a different thing. So I really hope that they've at least come to a better place. And many of them I think have because I've seen them progress. And I, I don't know how they could progress if they didn't believe something good was inside them. Okay. I like to end with this question. This podcast is all about finding more joy in the good days, the bad days and the in-between. What would you say is your number one tip to do that, to find the daily joy? Find what makes you happy and do it when you're sad or when you're mad and do it when you're happy. (laughs) (laughs) But whatever, whatever you do, Mm. be grateful for it because gratitude is in my mind, the number one emotion, the number one practice that will bring us back to a good place, no matter what is going on. 
And sometimes it takes time. It's not a switch that flips, yes. but it's worth it. Yes. And I love that you said it takes time because I do think gratitude is a practice. And I have had friends who've said, oh, I have nothing to be thankful for. In fact, I was talking to one (laughs) friend who said he had nothing to be thankful for while he was drinking a drink of water from the water bottle he just filled up at the drinking fountain. Exactly. And he probably has a flushing toilet. Yes, that too. Mm -hmm. Toilets, toilet paper. Pretty amazing. Well, Michaela, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I just absolutely loved talking to you. (laughs) It's been fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. I loved hearing Michaela's perspective. What do you think? Join the conversation online, Instagram, or Facebook. The best place to leave a comment is at daniellecraig.com. If you have any questions for Michaela, go ahead and message me privately. I will send those over to her and she will get back to you. If you're not subscribed, do so now. And right now I'm working on your next episode, how to start finding joy in the journey or exactly what this podcast is titled, happiness in the progress instead of waiting for the final destination. I'm so excited to share that with you. That's coming up in a few days. And I want to thank you for being here on Happiness and Progress.